there, welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Sarah. Today, well, no, not today. Actually, yesterday, we turned 25 years old, <laughs> which is kind of crazy to think about because I feel like I still have that mindset of like, I'm still 22. Like, I don't know why I'm stuck at the age of 22. Also, side note, I'm sorry if this echoes in here. We have, we just put new flooring in and we have like no furniture, so it's just like an open space and it echoes a lot. So this audio might suck. <laughs> when people ask me like, how old are you? I still wanna say that I'm 22, even though I'm like 23, 24, now 25. I might actually get this mindset from my dad because he's like in his 50s, but that man still thinks he's like in his 20s. Like literally, if you dare say that he's a year older than what he actually is, like be ready to be annihilated. Just with this look, he's just like, how dare you? Like, what, what, what are you even talking about? I'm still 20. I think that's like kind of his mindset, but in a way I would love to adapt that same mindset that he has because he's in his fifties and he can outrun me. And let me tell you, when I'm in good tip top shape <laughs> and I am like inconsistent with my running, like I can really run good and he can beat me. Even in his fifties, he can still freaking beat me in long distance and speed and everything. I think that's a good example to have because he doesn't allow his age to set limitations to certain things, which is kind of the mindset that I'd like to have as I was saying, I don't know how many times I have to say that. <laughs> um, just because I don't want to be like, oh, I'm a year older, I can't be doing this, this, and this. Like, I feel like I don't want to limit myself just because I'm a certain number. We're gonna stick to our young life of being 22, even though I'm not 22. So with that being said, I thought it would be kind of cool to do a like 25 things I've learned in my 25 years of life. The first thing that I've learned that took actually quite some time is to criticize less. I know that I used to be a very critical person, not just with others, but also myself. And that's something that I had to learn to take a step back and really just let it go. Like there's no reason for me to be criticizing others. Like what makes me think that I'm better just because I don't have the same like either sinful habits or have the same negative habits that, that somebody else might have. One of the best books that helped me realize this was The How to Win and Influence Friends. At first I was like, this sounds like a very manipulative book so I never bought it. But then once I started reading it, it has so much great value. I will actually link it down below because I highly, 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 highly recommend that everybody reads that book. So the second thing that I've learned is to be watchful of friends who instantly spill the beans about other people or tell you secrets that other people told them in confidence. And this one was a huge like red flag for me in friendships as an adult now, because I'm like, how are you telling me, especially for new friends, how are you telling me like all this gossip, basically, all these secrets that somebody else trusted you with? Like, how do you know that I'm not gonna go out there and tell other people? Or do you even care if I go tell other people? But then I sat back and thought about it. I'm like, what makes me want to trust them as a person? Like. If they're telling me what somebody else told them in confidence, why would I trust them? Why would I tell them anything? And these are the friends where you, well, not even friends, because I really recommend not keeping that type of people around because I feel like they will only be on the lookout for like what you say, what you screw up in, like how your marriage is going. Always just be prepared to like kind of say something about you. So I don't recommend having them around, but that is something that I will say is be very watchful of. If somebody's telling you all this gossip and secrets of other people, I uh, don't trust them. <laughs> it's better to keep them at a distance than to keep them close to your home. The third thing that I've also have learned with time is to ignore the when people say just wait until xyz and this used to be one of my biggest like paranoid moments because i would always hear like oh just wait until your honeymoon phase like like fades away or just wait until you have kids i've been told that so many times and i've been like what's going to happen like is it just gonna go downhill like is my marriage gonna suck um, is it like, we're never going to get along again? <laughs> is this baby going to ruin my life? And that's one thing we've been told a lot is when people are like, oh, you guys are still in your honeymoon phase. Just wait. And it's like, we're not necessarily in our honeymoon phase, but we've been able to understand how to get along, how to communicate, how to respect each other. It's like, yeah, it might look like we're in the honeymoon phase, but it's just because that's the way we choose to live. I've grown up 
in an environment where it was very argumentative, but I don't want that in my marriage. And I will work at it as much as I can to not have that in my marriage. And we also choose to love each other every single day. My point is, is to not fall into the just wait until X, Y, Z. Cause never like a just wait until positive. It's like, oh, just wait until negative. A lot of people say just wait until because that's what happened in their life situations, whatever. It doesn't mean it's gonna happen in yours. The fourth thing that I've learned is to set boundaries. This is with family, friends, work, your spouse, and yourself, because this will allow you to have control in your life to a certain extent. Obviously, things happen in our life that are out of our control, but you know, the way your spouse treats you, the way they talk to you, you can set that boundary straight from the get-go. With family, I know that's a little more tricky because it's family. So with family, you kind of gotta let it slide by sometimes. And while yes, that's true, there's also no. Like either you respect the boundary that I have set. If not, I mean, I'm sorry to tell you, but this might not work out. There's the door <laughs> or come back later whenever you decide to respect this. So important to set them from the beginning because once you set them in the middle or like you wait a little while, be like, oh, like this is not that big of a deal. Like it just happened once. People get into the habit. Your boss will get into the habit of asking and asking and asking. When you don't set that boundary, your spouse will keep treating you certain ways until you set that boundary. And if it's like set like after a long period of time, everybody's gonna be like, why? Like you were fine with it for so many months, so many years, like why is it an issue now? Like you never said a thing. And then that will cause more problems. <laughs> and then it will kind of make you feel like the boundary that you set was a little more excessive than it should have been. And it's probably not. It's just a solid boundary just set at the wrong time. The fifth thing is that you can improve your happiness and your mental health, attitude, etc. So there was a period of time in my life where I did struggle with severe depression, anxiety, and I had a little bit of a PTSD situation going on. And I just didn't want to be stuck in that mindset. Like I didn't want to live like that, my life like that forever. And it required a lot of work. It required a lot of years. A few things that I did was first, I tried to discover what really was affecting me. And the other thing is at the time I worked a lot and it's something that I needed and it's something I'm grateful for, right? Like working a lot can be a negative thing, but it also can be a positive thing if it's helping you kind of excel in areas that you want to excel and it's not really interfering with other life areas that also bring you life satisfaction. I started to work out a lot and I also just really gave myself grace in a lot of areas where I didn't before. And with the years passing by, it always got better and better and better. Another thing is you can't rely on outside sources or other people to bring you that happiness. That happiness has to come within yourself because external sources may not exist forever. And you don't want that when something, when someone could doing something that your happiness just tanks down again. So the sixth thing that I've learned is to forgive someone with, even if there's no apology offered. And this one was so stinking hard for me because I think it took a long time to forgive a lot of people, not a lot of people, but some people in my life. For me, it was just like, it was really interfering with my life in such a way where I'm like, I cannot allow this to be continuing on. And while it doesn't mean that they are 110% back in my life, it just means that I forgive them because I needed it. They might not know or understand the severity of what they did. And maybe they thought that that was the best way to do things, you know what I'm saying? And I just couldn't allow that to overtake my happiness, to overtake my life anymore. And I just decided I needed to forgive even if there was no apology there. The seventh thing that I had to learn kind of the hard way because I was always self-sabotaging myself is that I got into this mindset of like, okay, I don't know now, but in a few months, in a year, I will know. And this was whenever I started a new job, for some reason, I always felt like I should have known this. Like I literally like, this is common sense. Like, how do I not know this? How do I not know the system and stuff like that? And I would always be just so stressed out because I didn't know. And it, this has helped me just start YouTube, start my blog, start working in fields I wouldn't ever imagine working in. <laughs> if you're struggling with that, always repeat to yourself, you don't know now, but in a few months, in a year, you will know. And it will literally get you by. <laughs> Another thing that I learned is that friendships are actually super darn important. Even as an adult, they are so important. I don't know why individualism is pushed so hard 
especially I feel like in first world countries, individualism is like something that is really praised per se. And you're always kind of put into the mindset of like, don't rely on anybody for anything but yourself. Like it's better to be at the top 1% by yourself than with friends. And that's the thing though, it's like, why would you wanna be at the top percent by yourself? Like that would suck. If you can't go out, enjoy all the money that you have with friends, like what is the point of it? Like that just sounds kind of lame to me if you ask me. And it's not that you have to have like 15 good friends or whatever, one or two means the world. It can really change a lot of things. Friendships is something that I never took really serious because we moved so sinking much. We went to so many schools and we were never able to be there for like an extended amount of time to where you can cultivate a friendship. So to me, it's just like kind of, hey there, hang out for a while, leave, okay. Hey there, and then again. But I think now that I have found like my super, super like two good friends, I've discovered like the value that they bring into my life. Just the joy of having them around, of talking to them, even though none of them leave, live like, <laughs> within a five hour radius of me, <laughs> they all live very far away, is just so stinking fun and so nice to have someone that you can call, that you can reach out to and be like, oh my gosh, I'm struggling with this, or not even just like for your problems, but for the good things, or just the chit chat and just kind of, you know, spend your time with. It is so stinking important. It's so worth the effort. The ninth thing that I learned, that's kind of a tongue twister, <laughs> is that I will survive without social media. <laughs> Ever since I deleted social media about like two years ago, I don't have anything but YouTube. It has been the biggest game changer in my life. Like my life satisfaction has skyrocketed. My self-confidence, my self-esteem has skyrocketed from literally no social media. And I know for like a lot of people, social media isn't like that big of a problem or issue, you know, it's just like, Oh, just scroll and kind of close it and you're done with it. Often you feel so much worse after viewing whoever is in Dubai or somebody got this new job promotion and you're just like, I am literally 17 years behind in my life. Like what the heck is going on? If social media is an issue like that to you, I would just say delete it. You don't have to like delete it forever, but just delete it for like a few months, a few years and see how your life improves and see if you even want it back after a few years. Another thing is that timelines are literally a joke. So you know how when people are like, oh, by 18 you graduate high school, by 22 you graduate college, by 20, three to 25, you find your person, get married, buy a house. And then after that, you have babies. I don't know who the heck came up with these timelines, but they are a complete joke. Like these timelines make you way more stressed out in life than you would be without them. Like nobody has the same roadblocks. Nobody has the same life goals and stuff as you do as an individual. So it's like, none of these timelines matter. I don't have this timeline of like, I should have had this by this time. No, no. No, you shouldn't. It is what it is. <laughs> Number 11 is to never wait for people to do things with. I have always been like a little travel bug and I've always wanted to go to so many places. When you wait for people to do things with, you're gonna miss out on so many life experiences. There was a time where I wanted to go to Cancun. I couldn't find anybody to go to Cancun with me. So I booked a flight and I left by myself. I would not recommend going to Mexico by yourself. FYI. like. I was not using my brain cells then, but Mexico is probably not the safest to go, especially for a woman and by yourself. I feel like the Lord was literally with me through it all because literally I was just guided in so many ways, but I also know like the kind of the way that Mexico works. So in a lot of ways I would pay to get myself at the very front of the line for taxis. I would really, really trust my gut instinct. I was kind of smart in doing a lot of things. Like it's not like I was just like, oh, I was just wait outside here in the line for hours by myself. No, like I kind of use my brain cells too. <laughs> but going there was probably not the best choice. With that being said, there is a lot of female like travel bloggers that um, tell you like areas in the world that are safe for women to travel by themselves, areas where it's not, areas where they would have used way more precaution or kind of go with precaution. But get up and go, literally. If you're craving a specific dinner and you have nobody to go with, Go by yourself. Nobody's gonna care, really. I've gone out to dinner by myself so many times and I I literally uh, actually love it. Like I will sit up at the bar top and somebody will talk to me at one point. <laughs> no, I'll just talk with like the waitress or whoever's just there. The 12th thing is that money really does not bring happiness. In my life, 
we've lived in a lot of different areas, let me tell you. So we lived quite comfortably before my parents got divorced. It was like those situations where you're living comfortably, but you don't know how comfortable you are, right? And you're also kids, so you don't really care. Like making mud cakes was my <laughs> overall priority. <laughs> And then my parents got divorced and then we lived in a hotel for a little bit. We we're literally dirt poor. Uh, I think sometimes we were living off like one slice of bologna, two pieces of bread, and then we'll call it dinner, uh, living off of school lunches and stuff like that. That's like when my parents freshly got divorced. My mom was like trying to get back on her feet and whatnot. It was like really hard, but at that time, the best time of my life. We knew we were struggling, but it was still great. And then we lived very, very comfortably. My mom and my dad then opened up, well, my stepdad opened up like a concrete business and it just really went super well for them. So we lived very comfortably. And then I moved out and then I lived paycheck to paycheck, like really, really scraping by, budgeting like no other. So I've literally had all sorts of experience. I will have to say that. And the thing that I found is that I felt the happiest, not when I had excessive amounts of money, but when everything was like taken care of. So obviously, yes, money can bring happiness and relieve stress to a certain degree. Like if your bills are paid, if you can get groceries and you have a place to live, of course, that will increase your happiness and reduce your stress. After you have like money to kind of go out here and there, if you're that type of person, way more above that will not increase your happiness, I've discovered. And this is might be like a personal thing. Number 13 is to make the dang choice and take the chance. I live by this, <laughs> not in an impulsive way, because I've also learned to not be impulsive. <laughs> um, but basically how I learned this, first of all, was because my mom took the chance and made the choice when she divorced my dad. As an adult now, I see it as the biggest blessing in my entire life. Like I know this is probably not the best thing to say because biblically it's, it's like wrong to do, but I 100% trust that God saw our situation and was like, this is this is so much better for them. I at least hope and just really trust that he saw it that way. She left with zero money, right? She has three kids, we were all little and we had nowhere to go. And basically all we had was a vehicle and then I think we left with what we had on. She took the chance and I've seen it change her life in such a drastic way for the best. But she took the chance and if she never would have taken that, who knows, maybe the situation could have gone better or maybe a lot worse. And that's when I was like, you just never know. Just take the chance. If it goes good, great. If it goes bad, well, now you know. <laughs> Don't make the choice again. <laughs> I'm not saying get divorced, right? Like that is not what I wanna put out there at all. Like I'm not saying like, oh yeah, get divorced, it will improve your life. No, 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 no. This was specific to our situation. Number 14 is that ingredients matter more than what the label says. And what I mean by this is like the low sugars, the low calories, um, what else is there? Like low fat, stuff like that. None of those labels matter. What matters are the ingredients because when you see, let's use the example of Cheez-Its because I see this all the time and I love Cheez-Its. <laughs> Regular Cheez-Its compared to the, what is it like low fat, low calorie Cheez-Its or whatever. You don't know what ingredients they had to add to make it low fat, low calories or whatever to make it taste like the regular cheese. Sometimes it's just better to go with the regular Schmegler thing. Just get your regular cheeses and enjoy those in moderation. If you can't read labels, if you don't know how to pronounce it, don't buy it, just put it back on the shelf. Number 15 is to take care of your overall health, your physical, mental, emotional, and nutritional well-being. Taking care of yourself should be your top priority as an individual because when you let go of yourself, it is so hard to get back to the point A, wherever you wanna be. And I'm not saying like, oh, you have to like watch your calories, count your macros and stuff like that. No, taking care of ourselves, like what we eat, if we eat in moderation, eat good ingredients, go outside for at least 30 minutes a day, that's more than enough. You don't need to have your six pack abs to be taking care of your health. Take care of your mental health. If you need counseling, seek a counselor. This doesn't have to be because you grew up in a traumatic environment, stuff like that, no. Just do it if you need help on basically getting through college, getting through a relationship, communicating, learning like ways to communicate better in your marriage. Sometimes you just kind of need somebody to have an outside look into your life and kind of 
pick up points where you might be missing it. Number 16 is to never allow anybody to talk negatively about your spouse. I feel like the blood relation should be taken care of this. So for example, like if some of my family members were saying something negatively about my spouse, that is for me to be put a halt to it and not so much of his thing for him to defend himself. And that's the same thing with my husband. If his parents, his family are saying something that's for him to kind of step up for me and be like, this is not gonna work out. And that is something that I've always put a halt in because nobody should be talking negatively about your spouse to you or to him or in front of others. That's just very disrespectful in my personal opinion. And it's like, why are you insulting my best friend? <laughs> I'm like, no, no, no. Now with that being said, number 17 is to never talk negatively about your spouse with or without their presence to others. I've seen others do it and it's just like the most uncomfortable situation ever. If you have a friend who's talking negatively about you in front of others, like you know there's something wrong, like either they envy you or they have something against you and stuff like that, it's just not normal. And it's the same with you and your spouse. You and your spouse are BFFs, like best friends why would you want to talk negatively about them to others like it's none of their business it will make you only seem bitter and just a very overall not a great human being number 18 is that nobody thinks about you as much as you think about yourself <sighs> i had to learn this when one day we were taking a group picture and i'm like instantly what do i look like <laughs> what do i look like <laughs> and it's just like delete the picture delete the picture <laughs> i look like this and that i know for a fact that when i looked at that group picture everybody else went and looked at themselves as well. They weren't looking at others, they were just looking at themselves, the way they were standing, the way their belly looks, their hair, whatever. I know oftentimes we can be like, oh my gosh, like I don't wanna wear this because what are people gonna say? Or I don't wanna do this because what are people gonna say? Probably nothing. <laughs> if they do, so what? Number 19 is simple, hard to do, but very simple, is <laughs> to trust God in everything life-changing for me we'll have to say that number 20 is to not take things personally and this is a game changer for a lot of people it was for me um once i stopped taking things personally you know from people not wanting to hang out people not answering text messages or just when people say something negatively about me like to me or behind my back whatever i learned to not take that personally anymore and just kind of in one ear and out the other basically number 21 is budgeting is your best friend i always use the every dollar i think it's my an app by like dave ramsey or something like that and it has been life-changing whenever i was like living from paycheck to paycheck this was like the best thing that i could have done because it's so simple and you can also just see where your money's going budgeting the sooner you can start the better it is number two is do not rely on your credit card to do things this one i maxed out my credit card once and i think i only had like a i think my limit was only like two thousand or something like that at the time and it was extremely hard to pay it off especially when you're living paycheck to paycheck paying off my credit card was a priority but then also the interest rates that racked up with my credit card and like seeing how much was actually like going to the principal amount it was like insane so once i pay that off i literally just made a pact that i was never ever going to use my credit card in the way that i used it before and obviously i still keep it because in the states you need to have a credit score and like be able to verify that you can do your payments and stuff like that so i kept it i use it more reasonably and i never put things that i can't pay for in cash number 23 i learned to work for the future but live in the present and this is something that was so hard for me because anything and everything that I ever did in my life was for the future. And it was up to the point where I like couldn't even sit down without thinking about the future. And I feel like I missed out on so much in life because I was never able to be fully present in anything that I was doing. While I do believe that you should work, that you should plan for the future, it, that's, that isn't where your mindset should be all the time. Number 24 I learned is to not expect for people to read your mind. This is for your spouse, your family, your friends, et cetera, for work and often get into the mindset of like, well, we've been together for this many years. Like, how does he not know that he should be doing this or that I need this when I'm feeling like this? If they did know, they'd probably do it, but you can probably avoid about 80% of arguments if you were to voice what you want. And that can be just a simple like, hey, to your spouse, like, hey, can you throw away the trash? Hey, can you help me here? Um, hey, I just really need time for myself. Can I, can I get a hug? Whatever you need, ask. 
don't just be sitting there expecting it and then like when they don't do it just like have that resentment or just like that anger towards them because they should have known number 25 the last thing that i've learned is that while communication is vital in a relationship or marriage i also think that respect is a key thing in marriage because you can communicate all you want but if you're communicating in a very disrespectful way then you're going to miss the big points so anywho <laughs> Those are the 25 things that I have learned in my 25 years of life. I hope you guys have enjoyed watching and I will catch you guys on the next one.